um, so that we're all aware of how we're going to spend the next two hours together. We're gonna to start with our welcome and introductions in just a second, and then move on to our outcomes and norms, talk about the materials that we need to be using today. We're going to revisit coordinator roles and responsibilities, talk about our year three data that we have gathered from August 1st through December 17th of 2022, uh, 2020. <laughs> uh, year three submission observations. We'll be talking about things we have been seeing in the submissions and giving you some guidance. We'll talk about the assessment materials and system updates so that you are well aware of uh, how to access these materials and updates. We'll move on to talk a little bit about the commission's COVID-19 flexibilities and responsibilities. We'll talk about upcoming spring events and supports around Cal TPA, and then we'll close and we'll have a quick evaluation that we'll ask you to complete for us. Next slide, please. So we wanna start by saying welcome and do some introductions. I am Amy Rising, the Director of Performance Assessment Policy and Development for the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. And I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Zoltan, Cassandra, and James. So we'll start with Zoltan. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm Zoltan Sarda. I'm uh, new to the commission. This is my third month. Um, and I am a consultant with the Performance Assessment de uh, Development, focusing on the Cal TPA. Thank you, Zoltan. Uh, Cassandra, you want to say hi real quick? Might be on mute. So sorry. I am also new to the division um, and this is my third week and I'm a consultant in the performance assessment development division focusing on early childhood education uh, performance assessment. Great, thank you, Cassandra and James. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you and glad you could be here. I am a consultant with performance assessment development primarily with the Ed Specialist Cal TPA, but for today's role, I will be the producer of this meeting. So I will be monitoring the chat and also any of the uh, technology that we have today. Great. Thank you, James. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues in evaluation system so that they can introduce themselves. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tina Freshour, uh, Program Manager uh, with Evaluation Systems. Been working with the Commission on the development and implementation and excited to share with you some year three findings. Um, and it's great to see so many familiar faces. Thanks for joining us. Liz? You too may be on mute. Sounds like Liz might be having audio trouble. So while she's working on that, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Lori Thornley and I too am a program manager at Evaluation Systems. Um, I'm, I see a lot of familiar names and faces. Welcome, I'm glad to be with you this here with you this afternoon. Andy? You bet. Hi, I'm Andy Waybright, and I know it says scoring director, but that's what I am with CSET. I joined the performance world uh, last year, and I'm happy to be here with you guys. And we'll just introduce Liz. She'll join us. Uh, she's with us. She's also recently joined the team, right, Tina? Uh, and we're happy to have Liz Presley with us as well. So let's move on to the next slide, and I'll turn it up to you, uh, Zoltan. Okay, so we're going to just focus on the outcomes. Uh, for today from the agenda. Uh, we have six main outcomes uh, continuing to build the learning community. You're going, you're going to have an opportunity to meet with a couple of other folks from different programs um, in breakout rooms today. Looking at, again, the webinar materials, re, sort of defining and re-supporting uh, that idea of what your roles are, coordinator roles. Um, and then a big part of this is looking at the data um, from year three in order to support your candidates going forward. Um, and then also part of that is understanding flexibilities for COVID-19 and thinking about what's coming up um, in, the, in the coming months. So you go to the next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk about meeting norms. I love this. Uh, looks a little bit like my space right now. Uh, and I'm sure for many of us, but if we can go to the next uh, slide, James. 
So for the norms for today, we've actually, we've uh, muted your microphone. Um, if, you, if you need to speak, if you could please wait till you're called on so that we don't get a lot of background noise. Um, we want to use the chat as a, as a tool here. So if you have questions, uh, please post them in the chat. Later on when you're in the breakout rooms, I'll be asking you to also uh, enter your, your responses to that breakout room in the chat as well. Um, we would, if we can keep the questions uh, to general questions, and if you have questions for about your program, specific program, if you could uh, email those us at a separate time. Um, avoiding multitasking uh, is key here for all of us, and then uh, also honoring the time um, for participants and presenters. Also, uh, you should have received yesterday, uh, I believe from uh, from Lori, uh, these. Uh, two materials, so uh, the updated coordinator contact list and um, the, the CTC, CDE, SBE letter on supporting candidates that was drafted in October. If you have not received those in the last couple of days, if you could please uh, email uh, at this address. All right, so we always like to start ourselves by grounding ourselves in our work. So we thought it would be important, once again, with all of you who have been involved with us, perhaps for years, or perhaps you're just joining this important work in California by starting with, why do we require a teaching performance assessment? Part of the reason uh, that we require a teaching performance assessment is so that we have all teachers across the state of California demonstrating the teaching performance expectations, the TPEs, across our six domains in a consistent manner so that a ways from our UCs to our CSUs to our private institutions of higher ed to our county office of ed programs and our LEA programs, all of our teachers coming through our teacher preparation programs, all of a chance to demonstrate their knowledge, skill, and ability in relation to the teaching performance expectations in a consistent manner. And we want to remember the purpose of each cycle. We have two cycles. The design team purposefully determined that we would break this um, a performance assessment up into two instructional cycles so that candidates could engage at, uh, in them across time. They could be formative and summative. The first cycle, cycle one, planning, learning experiences um, is around really looking at planning those experiences with student assets and learning needs in mind. So one lesson, one group of students, three focused students with that additional third student that experienced trauma, reflecting on that practice and thinking about how to apply the learning from that one lesson for that one group of students. And in cycle two, which comes typically later in a teacher preparation program for a candidate. Candidates are asked to be entering into the work in a little bit more of a complex way. We're now asking them to tell us about three to five lessons and to use those and assessments, three types of assessments, informal, student self-assessment, formal assessment, to look across that classroom-based assessment data and to make decisions about instructional planning, again, from an asset-based perspective. So designing assessments to drive instructional planning. So those are the big ideas and the purpose of each cycle. And when we put those cycles together, we get a pretty good picture across quite a number of TPEs and across the six domains of how teachers are performing in their early practice. Next slide, please. We're gonna go ahead and move into um, starting our conversation with you today about your roles and responsibilities that you're playing uh, that are so important to the overall um, success really of this performance assessment for the, for the candidates themselves, for your programs, and of course, um, for the commission. And so we're gonna start by revisiting your roles a little bit. We're gonna look at this first slide and say, uh, of course, in your program coordinator role, you're really that person that we're counting on to hold it all together at the level of the program, at the institutional level. And in your role, we expect you to help other faculty understand about the CalTPA, 
to reach out and have ways to support candidates and to support those support providers out there in the districts, the supervising teachers who are helping candidates as they do uh, their student teaching work and or our interns in the teacher preparation program. And to see um, that your role is connected uh, across all of these different groups and that you're kind of the point person. We talk to you and we hope that you in turn talk to all these other uh, groups from the candidates to the faculty to the support providers. Next slide. You're juggling a lot and we understand that. In addition, we want you to also be thinking about on a monthly basis and on a quarterly basis, the data that's coming in. You have the opportunity through Reports Analyzer and Ed Reports to see who's signed up each month, who's in the system and registered, and then as that data starts to come back. So we understand that you're juggling a lot from teaching and remediation to communications with everyone, reports and data, thinking about how to provide training, and then of course, meeting those deadlines for submission. I'm going to turn it over now to Zoltan. Okay, uh, and again, we know you wear a, a lot of hats for this work. Um, and so we just part of the next few minutes, we want to be checking in on um, how that is working for you. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, and again, just as a reminder, um, there are four main uh, responsibilities that coordinators have uh, responsibilities to the candidates, uh, responsibilities to faculty and staff. Uh, to the commission and evaluation systems and to your institution. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, James. Um, and we're going to divide you now into some breakout rooms. In a moment, I'm going to give you put into the chat a link to the next this slide and the next four slides. And th these will guide your, um, your conversations. We, we're going to spend 16 minutes. Uh, we've given you a little to do list. You'll be in, there'll be three people in each of your rooms. Uh, we would like you to introduce yourselves and your pro which program you rep represent. Um, and then there are four slides that cover those responsibilities and some details. We'd like you to review those, do that um, independently. And then with a, as a group to, for about 10 minutes, just discuss around these three questions. Uh, what's going well? What requires more support and or attention? And what questions do you have? We're going to ask you to choose one person to just type up, uh, write up as, as you're discussing uh, and record uh, your observations to these questions. And when we get back in the main room, I'll ask that person to um, upload that um, text to, to the chat. It's going to be very helpful for us to understand where the different programs are and where we can uh, further support. Um, if you have a burning question in your group, um, that you'd like to have answered immediately in our in our debrief session at the end, if you could email that to James Webb um, at, uh, at his uh, email address. So right now I'm going to put, if you can um, access this document, uh, it's, it's a short presentation of five slides um, and it has the instructions first and then the four slides on the responsibilities. Um, if you can access that, that before James put you, you into the uh, breakout rooms. And James, I think we're going to need about what, 25 breakout rooms, something like that. Uh, yes, Sultan. So I've already uh, gone ahead and uh, created the breakout rooms. They are going to be uh, mixed. They're random. Uh, there is a timer for the participants to know how much time that they have. And then also at the 60 second mark, you will get a notification that you will be returned back to the main room. Okay. So I am also uh, going to stop uh, the recording uh, when I put everyone into breakout rooms. So Zoltan, are you ready for me to assign? Yes. Okay, so I'm Thank opening you. the rooms now. Hope that was productive and you got to chat a little bit. Um, if you could, if you, the recorder for each of the group, if you could make uh, cut and paste your um, responses into the chat. We will we will uh, make sense of those, synthesize them together, and get the uh, results of that back out to you next week. Um, this will really, uh, I think, this will be useful for all of us, but particularly um, for our needs in, in working to support. If we didn't get any um, specific burning questions to James, 
Again, if you have questions for us uh, about sp your specific program, you could uh, email us at caltpa at ctc.ca.gov. Um, also, we have our office hours every week, um, but we will get this information back out to you. I see people populate those in. Thank you so much. That looks, this is exactly the kind of data and information that's gonna be very helpful. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tina. All right, thank you so much. Um, we did wanna take some time today to look at um, the data that we've accumulated throughout the fall of 2020. Um, if we could move to our first slide, this shows us our submission numbers. Um, so we've had seven submission deadlines since the year three program uh, year of, started on August 20th was our first reporting date all the way through December 17th. And as you see, numbers were pretty low uh, as we went through August through November, but we did see a significant increase in the number of submissions um, for the December 17th reporting. Um, so, you know, I expect that in the spring we will continue to see increases in the numbers more aligned to where we were last year. Um, moving on to the next slide, we've break, broken down our submissions for multiple subject and single subject by cycle. And a, as expected, um, more cycle ones in the fall than cycle two, um, and pretty even between our multiple subject and single subject, just a little percent higher um, in terms of the number of multiple subject candidates for cycle one. And moving on to our next slide, we can see statewide uh, percent of pass rate um, for each of the different multiple subject cycles. So remember candidates must select whether or not their cycle one is in math or literacy, and if their cycle two is in math or literacy. Um, our uh, cycle two uh, candidates are definitely performing uh, stronger in cycle two than in cycle one. And in cycle one, uh, math seems to be a little bit stronger than literacy, about an 11 point distribution there. And then the next column, you can see the mean scores. So 19, as you know, is our cut score for cycle one. And cycle two is 21 points. Um, so you can see the mean score is above um, that cut score for cycle two and just very close for cycle one. All right, next slide, please. We're now gonna look at the same data, submissions, pass rates, mean scores, and the total possible scores. Uh, this is cycle one for all single subject areas that we've received submissions during the fall of 2020. So low number of submissions in ag and in health, but the other areas, um, had you know higher number of submissions. Our pass rates range between 63% in world language all the way up to 100% in arts, and you know strong 80s and 90s in many of the other areas for single subject. We'll now look at the next slide, which is the same data, but now for cycle two. And just like we saw in cycle uh, two for multiple subjects, cycle two for single subject also performs a little bit higher. Candidates um, are, are passing at a higher percentage again on cycle two than on cycle one. Um, so I'll pause and just let you take a look at that data. All right, let's move on. And let's Tina, hang on one sec before you yes, go on. Please. If everyone would be so kind as to check and make sure that you are on mute, we're getting a little bit of feedback, uh, which makes it hard, I think, for us all to hear. So if you just check real quick, that'd be awesome. All right, uh, Tina, back to you. All right, if we could move on, we're now, oops. I thought I put myself on mute. Uh, moving on to look, uh, drilling down further by rubric, how are our candidates doing? And as we look here closely at multiple subjects, cycle one and cycle two rubrics, we have a consistent lowest performance around rubric six. In cycle one, rubric six has some key components, one of which is addressing next steps for learning the content. 
And for cycle two, rubric six is around self-assessment. And there are several components that must be addressed in cycle two um, for rubric six in self-assessment. All right, so that was multiple subject rubric level performance. Let's take a look at single subject um, cycle one rubric level performance. And look at that, all the way down rubric six, we're seeing um, the lower sets of scores, um, none in the green, if you will, across the various content areas. And um, moving on to cycle two for single subject. Next slide, please. Rubrics five and six come out here. Um, so looking at this data, we if we look concentrate on the planning rubrics, which are rubrics one, two, and three, we do see more scores at or above level three than we do in the remaining three steps. So the planning is looking a little bit stronger um, than the teach and assess, reflect, and apply when we take a look at cycle two. I know that was a lot of- Tina, just to back up a second, there are two rubrics in planning in cycle two. Ah, okay, thank you for that. Thank you for reminding me of that. Yep. So the first uh, rubric in step two um, is, is performing stronger than the other three rubrics in step two. Excellent. All right. Well, that was a lot of data, so I just want to pause and um, go to questions about the data. You know, we have a question. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, James, please. No, I was just going to say, and James is going to help us with our <laughs> questions in the chat. So, James. <laughs> thank you. So, <clears throat> yes, thank you. So, Marianne uh, asks, how do these passing rates compare to the 2019-2020 uh, school year? Um, for multiple subjects, they, they are lower. Uh, than they were last year. Um, there were some changes made and also the transition to a virtual learning environment also seems to have had an impact on candidates ability to achieve that higher score range um, specifically in, in those early grades. Uh, Amy, is there anything you wanna add? Yes, uh, I just want to assure all of you that we are very aware of what's happening in the multiple subject data, that it's uh, coming down a little bit. Um, it is lower than it was last fall during these six months. And we are having many conversations at the commission level about how to address this. Uh, in addition, we're just being very careful and checking uh, everything from rubric level scores, to cross cycle scores, to thinking about the difference we're seeing between multiple subject and single subject. We're thinking a lot about who are these candidates that have submitted between August and December. Are they candidates primarily who have come out of prep programs and come into induction and may not have the same level of support? In addition, as we are all so aware, COVID uh, and any of the other uh, really pandemics we're facing that, that all have come underway since uh, last March um, have really impacted people's lives, including all of our teacher candidates, including all of you, including our school districts and all of the educators in those schools that we have always uh, hoped would help our teacher candidates. So as we look across that entire landscape, we are quite aware of the dip in the scores and we are having many conversations at the policy level to see uh, what other flexibilities perhaps could be in place to support candidates, uh, given how different the settings are now for our teacher candidates. So I wanna reassure you that we are well aware. Um, we are not seeing that this is, uh, this is really kind of an across the board lowering of scores. We're not seeing like a particular point in that. We've uh, worked very closely with our assessors and lead assessors starting last March to make sure that uh, the assessment itself was not impacted, that we are still making equal and equitable assessment uh, decisions about submissions and evidence that has come in. But we are quite aware that there is a lower performance that's being submitted uh, and we're working through that. 
So stay tuned. Um, and I would highly recommend all of you to look at your own data for your own program and do the same kind of analysis. Are your scores in your institution, in your program, are they lower this fall than they were last fall? Uh, can you put your finger on what's happening? So uh, together, we're all gonna need to support our candidates. And so, uh, yes, we're quite aware of those scores going down. Um, just one okay. point on the data oh. that, oh, sorry, James. Um, I was just- That's okay. That um, the data presented reflected candidates um, who uh, received a score. It does not include data regarding condition codes. We'll be covering that in detail in just a little while. Um, sorry, James, I just wanted to add that in. No, thank you so much, Tina. Uh, actually, Lori has been uh, great at helping to answer questions in the chat, but I want to have one more before we move forward to the uh, observations, and that is from Patty. Have assessors been coached to truly understand the differences in scoring when a submission is a virtual classroom environment? And that is an excellent question. Yeah. Go and so I'm going to turn it to you, Tina, and your team to talk about all of the things that we have put into place starting last March to assist our assessors and our lead assessors to ensure that the switch from an in-person setting to an online setting was not uh, interacting with the final judgment of the evidence submitted. But I'll turn it to you, Tina, to talk through some of those um, Great. reports we put in place. Well, thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, starting in March when, you know, the transition happened, schools were closed, and as uh, schools reopened, but in distance learning, we carefully uh, had our lead assessors review and score our virtual learning along with con uh, consultation with the commission so that we could gain a deep understanding of what nuances would in fact be encountered now that we've transitioned to a digital learning environment. With that, uh, the uh, commission and the lead assessors created a training curriculum that was delivered to all returning assessors for the fall. That was the first time our fall assessors were trained and calibrated in an online setting. So um, they had an opportunity to engage in training and then demonstrate their knowledge and ability to score regardless of setting. We also throughout uh, fall scoring uh, implement what is called validity submissions. Those are pre-scored submissions that are released to the entire scoring pool. And that provides data on how well they align and have they remained calibrated or have they experienced a level of drift. And there's a combination of both in-person setting validities as well as online setting validities. And after uh, each month, our leads meet with their group of assessors to go over that validity submission to again provide additional training. So uh, a lot of robust data uh, review to make sure our assessors are remaining calibrated, but also a strong focus on what's new, what's different in an online setting. Uh, so um, yes, we have been extremely careful in making sure that we have prepared our assessor pool and our lead assessors uh, in this two-tiered kind of assessment system we have in place to make sure that uh, online settings are not treated differently than in-person settings as far as the capacity to meet the teaching performance ex expectation that's being me measured. So with that, what we'd like to do is go ahead and move on uh, to our next set of slides, and we will be getting into these um, into the data that we have uh, for you in a little bit around the issue of when a condition code is given. And remember, a condition code is given to a candidate when there is an omission of evidence, something is not included or submitted, uh, or uh, there's a reason for which there's not enough evidence for a score judgment to be made. So a condition code does not mean that a candidate failed. A condition code means they did not submit the evidence we needed to make a score judgment. So that's a, an important distinction. But let's continue. We have some observations now that we would like to share with you based on the submissions we have been um, reading and assessing this fall. So with that, we'll, we'll go to the next slide, James. Thank you. So uh, some general observations. We do want to encourage candidates to refer to the rubrics during their writing and editing. And we, we can't say this enough. 
the rubric at level three, four and five, even two, clearly lays out what the evidence needs to have in order for the candidate to be at that level on the rubric. So referring your candidates to the rubrics, making sure that they are well aware of what the rubric is asking for is an important step. The second thing we wanna point out is that um, we want to make sure you're using current and correct California standards. We want our candidates to understand they are pursuing a California teaching credential, the California student academic content standards that are published on the Department of Education website that are linked to in the assessment guide are the standards they should be using. Uh, an important point to add here is if you do have English learners in your classroom that you tell about in the context section in step one, we do need to see English language development uh, standards used in the instructional planning. Third point, we want to encourage candidates to review responses to assure they are not simply restating the prompts in their answer, but actually answering the questions and explaining their thoughts and findings uh, and really uh, engaging in reflective writing. So, um, we have seen uh, responses that are almost exact repeat of the question asked, and they don't take the next step and really get into giving us a response based on the instruction they just provided to a particular set of students. So again, um, work with your candidates there, and then assure that your candidates are engaging students in learning rather than uh, lecturing at them. We've seen a move towards a lot more direct instruction where we're hearing uh, a lot from the teacher candidate and not so much from the students engaging in learning. And uh, that may be um, an area that is um, leading to some lower scores. So we really want to see that synchronous instruction that is between the teacher and the students in their submissions. Let's go to the next slide. Particularly in cycle one, a few observations to share with you. Um, clip one. Video clip one is the most effective video to demonstrate that review of prior knowledge. Now, Tina showed you some data across the rubrics at the rubric level, and we have consistently seen not only this fall, but last spring as well, and even earlier, Candidates struggling with cycle one in regards to rubric 1.5, which part of 1.5 says we need to see the prior knowledge taught. We need to understand what was taught before this lesson in content wise. What content was taught prior to this lesson? And then clip three, video clip three, is another effective way to show us what's going to happen next. What is the next step with the content instruction? So it's, it's intriguing to see this pattern show up. Uh, as I said, we saw this last spring. I think we've already talked to you about this in coordinator workshops. We're gonna talk to you about again today. Candidates need support in understanding that they need to be clear about the content that was taught before the lesson they're showing us, and then what content will be taught next. We're not sure why candidates are struggling with these two requests but they are significantly struggling to tell us what was taught prior to the lesson and what will be taught, the content that will be taught as the next lesson following the lesson we see in cycle one. So um, please make a note about that uh, and think about how to support your candidates and understanding the importance of knowing what was taught before a lesson and then where that lesson is going, what will be taught next. Next slide, please. I'm gonna go ahead uh, at this point and turn it back to Zoltan. Okay, and so for cycle two, we're seeing some repeating um, observations from the lead assessors as well. Um, around the, the work on student self-assessments, um, one of the, th we're seeing a few things. One is we're not seeing the students actually assessing themselves with a tool uh, against the content. There are um, a, a lot of examples of them sort of doing a, a feeling or a smiley face sort of rubric. You know, how did you feel about uh, what you were, uh, how you did on that, rather than specific to the content. Mm -hmm. So again, the idea here is that the teacher is going to model doing a self-assessment and then a student is actually going to uh, 
uh, assess themselves against a standard uh, that's related to the content. Um, th there's quite a few of, of that uh, kind of thing coming in. Uh, again, with the student work, we need to see uh, submissions from three students that have been formally assessed, um, including all of the rubrics that go, that go with that. Um, and then just as, this is just a small detail, but we're getting quite a few um, where all the lessons, uh, lesson plans are put into one template as opposed to separate ones. Uh, the way I sort of think of this is that uh, it's helpful to curate the submission so that the assessor is guided through it and, and to have separate lesson plans um, helps that, facilitates that. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So uh, again, a lot of questions. Again, this is, uh, you know, as we just experienced with our Zoom calls, it's, uh, it's a new normal for everyone. Um, but a couple of things, I think one of the things we really want to work with candidates on is to possibly rehearse what their filming looks like before they get into teaching with the, stu with the students. So at the, we're seeing a lot of things and we're gonna have some images here in a, in a moment of what we're seeing uh, that, that are helpful um, versus problematic. Um, but making sure that the ca camera angles are not so, um, so strong that you can't see or it's too far away. And these are just some reminders about what we need for cycle one. In clip one, we need to see at least one student and how we're referring in office hours to the student or to the candidates is that if it is uh, a singular student, student, that's one. If it's students, that's two or more. Um, so we must see the student and candidate in clip one. We must see two or more students and the candidate in clip two. And then again, in clip three, we need to see one student and the candidate. And if we could go to the next one for cycle two. Again, there are four video or five videos here. Uh, all of them are two or more students, except clip four, we need to see the, the candidate modeling self-assessment with two or more students and then giving feedback to at least one student. So one student get, uh, giving, getting feedback is sufficient for that. Um, and with that, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Tina. We have some examples of some images that uh, illustrate some of these points. And I'm just gonna jump in here real quick before we look at the pictures together, because we do hope that when we show you some of these screen captures that will really illuminate what, what is um, needs, we need to see in order to score. So let's just go back to the slide right before this one, James, please. So again, I just wanna pause here and make sure because I saw a number of comments in the chat, like do we need two students or three students or four? Uh, what we're doing in order to be as fair and equitable as possible is given the current assessment guide that candidates receive when they register. Each video clip has a description. In each description, it speaks to uh, the notion of how many students we absolutely must see. And we decided this was the most fair way to do it because this is the information that is in front of our candidates. So in the video description, if the word student has an S on the end of it, we need at least two or more students in the video capture. If it's the word student with no S in the description in the guidebook, then it's one student. So if you're wondering how we came up with these guidelines, it is based on the language in the assessment guide as it has been published and as it uh, has been available um, to candidates when they registered starting in July of last year. So again, just to be very clear, because this question comes up uh, every week on office hours and when we have our office hours with candidates. So going back to cycle one, video clip one, one student and the candidate, video clip two, two or more students and the candidate, one or more students and the candidate for video clip three. Notice the candidate must be seen in each one of the video clips in cycle one, but it's one student at least in the first video two or more in the second, one at least in the third. And again, based on the actual language in the assessment guide, we do not have to see their faces. You will not see the word face in any of the video descriptions, but we do need to see synchronous instruction between the candidate and the students. 
We also don't need to see the candidate's face. Now, is it more helpful to see faces when we're looking at instruction? Yes, it is because we can watch those expressions, but if we have not asked for that, but we must see the synchronous interaction between the candidate and the one student in video clip one, the two at least students in video clip two, and the one student in clip three. So we hope this is clear. Let's go to the next slide. And again, cycle two, a little more complex, multiple lessons, multiple types of assessments, five video clips. So again, uh, two or more students and candidate. Clip two, this is important, make a note. This is the only video clip in the two cycles where we do not have to see the candidate because this video is about us being able to see students engaging with, uh, with um, technology, educational technology. So we don't have to see the candidate here. We do need to see two or more students engaging in using ed tech to further their content knowledge. Video clip three, two or more students and the candidate. Clip four, this one's a little confusing the way we wrote it. We are very carefully going to look at the language and clear it up for next year. But right now we need to see the candidate modeling self-assessment for the class, right, originally. But now we're saying at least for two students. And then we need them to give some feedback to at least one student. And if you look at that language closely, you'll see that we use both the word student without the S and students with the S. So this one is a little more complex. So please carefully read that and carefully guide your students, candidates. Clip five, two or more students and the candidate. So we are hoping that this is helpful. Again, where did this come from? This came from the assessment guide. So hopefully this is helpful. And again, you can always reach out and ask additional questions, but we hope this makes it more clear uh, going forward. We are trying to be as flexible as we possibly can in support of candidates. We understand conditions right now are really tough and we're trying to be as helpful and flexible as we can without stepping outside what this assessment was designed to measure. So um, again, we are trying to be supportive of candidates and uh, we're going to go look at some slides now and show you some exact pictures that may be Amy, yes. Amy, before we proceed, I just want to go back and um, revisit that language for step two video clip four. Um, we did highlight the two or more students in terms of the modeling because it should be for the class. But if the candidate selects the portion of the video clip that only shows the feedback to at least one student. It really is for clip four, we have to see the one student and the candidate. Um, so I, I think maybe we can rework this slide a little bit before we send it back out to say that um, it is actually one student that's been required throughout year three for clip four. Thank you. And Amy? And Zoltan, uh, we're getting a number of questions in the chat. Did you want to uh, address some of these or would you rather wait to another uh, moment in the presentation? I think let's take a look at the photographs that we're going to present next. Okay. And that may answer a lot of the questions, James. And then we'll come sure. Back. Okay, so I'll take this one. Um, these are the acceptable in platform formats. And the one on the left is the one that we obviously love to see, a whole screen full of students smiling or otherwise, um, either at the beginning of the video or somewhere in the middle or at the end. Um, this is really, this is what we love to see. Um, these other ones are also good where you can see the students in the little squares, kind of like how we see in Zoom, um, either off on the side or on the bottom. Um, also the ones where you can see it in speaker view when it switches from student to candidate to student, that's fine as long as those students have their cameras on and we can see the student. Um, can you see the next slide? Okay, so uh, the candidates are getting very creative with their recording. And these ones are examples of creative and effective. Uh, they are using um, an extra screen in there, which is different. Um, but the one on the left, they had someone holding the camera that was recording and they zoomed in 
on that smaller screen so we could see the students, we could see them moving around, we knew they were there. Um, and on the one on the right, we can see them on that larger screen in the back. Um, and so that's really good because this is a nice distance and angle. And if you have a helpful person nearby that could help you zoom in, that's even better. Um, other suggestions from the lead assessors is to, if you're gonna be recording it yourself, just put the camera that's recording in front of you instead of behind you. Um, the candidate usually shows up on the screen so we can see them there. Um, but when it's behind, it gets a little bit tougher to see the students in those little squares. And if we can go to the next one. Okay, so this is the example <laughs> of using the camera to record. It's just too far away. Um, the distance plus the angle makes it very difficult to tell if those students in those tiny little squares are actually engaged and visible in those little squares. They could be photos or avatars. Um, and so if it was just a little bit closer, had a better angle, um, other than that, we'd like to see a lot of movement in those squares to determine that the students are in fact there. And to the next slide. Um, so we see a lot of these. Uh, we see avatars instead of students. Uh, we do need to see the student. Um, okay, and go to the next one. And then here's a whole sea of them. Uh, we have avatars, we have profile photos, we have first initials. Um, I believe the only face we see there is the candidate. Um, we would like to see, we need to see the students for the requirement. Okay, and to the next one. This one's really interesting, a collection of ceilings, floors, and walls. Um, so again, it's not enough for the cameras to be on, cameras really have to be focused on the students. Okay, in the next slide. Um, here's one that's in the classroom, which is great, but uh, for some reason, the lead assessors are seeing a lot of these where the camera is pointing right at the candidate. And while it's in the classroom, we're not seeing the class. So having the camera maybe behind the students pointing at the candidate would be a better angle than this one uh, because we do need to see the students. Okay, next one. All right, so uh, there are additional tips for working in online settings that are in the guidelines for completing the Cal TPA on the CTC exams website. And I believe the next one is going to Liz. Yep. So next slide. You may be wondering how often condition codes are given. Liz, so hang on, who, hang on a second. Let's okay. let's just pause here if you don't mind before we get into condition codes and see James, do we have a few questions we can take uh, based on those uh, pictures that we just looked at with Andy? Yes, uh, some did come in. Um, just a clarification, uh, Tim, uh, cameras need to be on during the video clip, yes? For students? Yes. We need yes. To see the students. It yes. cannot be nope. a picture or an animation. Not the entire time, but at some point, we do need to see the students. Okay, Susie says uh, she's a little confused. Uh, she was under the impression that uh, they don't need to see faces, just interaction. I uh, want to clarify that uh, to make sure that uh, they have the understanding. Okay, um, we do need to see the students, maybe not you know, right on their face. It could be more like, I see a little bit of the ball caps on the kids um, and we see a lot of hand gestures coming up into the screen. Um, it really is the clearest to the assessors if it is showing the students' faces. Um, but interaction has to be seen and not just through like a chat. Okay, uh, another question that's come up is um, 
if the minimum number of students for the clip have their cameras on and the rest have video muted, will that suffice? I'm sorry, so, James. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So Andy. the minimum, so for example, if they have the required number of students uh, for the video clip, but the rest of the students are muted, is that okay? Was Amy gonna say something on this? I, I, I believe the answer is yes. As long as we, yes. as long as we have the one or two or more students and that student, we can hear them, we can see them, they're interacting synchronously with the teacher candidate, then we're good to go, right? Andy, that's yep. what we're yeah. doing. All the rest of them can show the avatars. <laughs> right, uh, so we have another one. Uh, do we need to coach? This is from Jordan. Uh, do we need to coach candidates to remove student names from their Zoom boxes, or is it okay for student names to be visible? And then what about the candidate name? Again, the assessment guide says, please redact the name. Please take student names off um, if you can. We, are, uh, we do have a very secure system. When things come into us with student names, we are taking them anyway. We are not giving them a condition code at this point. Again, trying to be flexible and supportive of candidates. But when they can do that, they should do that. Okay, uh, another one from Chris. Uh, districts that are not allowing videos of students, how do we deal with this? So um, how we deal with that is we offer the candidate the executive order option, and we inform them that they don't have to do the Cal TPA during their teacher preparation program, that they have the opportunity through the executive order issued by the governor to um, exit the teacher preparation program with the Cal TPA as a requirement that still needs to be um, met and they can come into induction and they have up to five years to complete their Cal TPA. That's one option. Another is the waiver. And we'll talk about some of these options again when we get a little farther into the presentation. Um, so we understand conditions are difficult. We understand districts are the ones who are deciding about video um, policy. And if a candidate is placed in a district and videos are not allowed, then they have the flexibilities that the commission has offered to delay passing the Cal TPA. The other option you have as a program is to help that candidate find another placement. We have any other questions, James? Well, just one uh, uh, that I can ask. Uh, the uh, executive order SB 820 is extended through August 31st of 2021. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Because there was a question about candidates entering uh, in January. So, okay, um, that's it. So I think we can move forward and start, uh, go, turn it back to Liz to uh, have the conversation with condition codes. Great. Yep. Thanks. So here we go. So this is how often we are seeing these from August through December 17th. So this column, these are the number of examinees that attempted and this is the first attempt, second, third, fourth. And then these are the number of examinees with condition codes. So these are their attempt numbers and these are the percentages. So for cycle one, first try, first attempt, 2069. And then for condition codes, 190. So that was about 9%. And then cycle two, 965 attempted on their first try. 165 received condition codes, so a higher percentage, so 17%. So this is coming to you, the slides, so you can analyze it in more detail um, in your own leisure time. Uh, next slide. Okay, so now how often are we seeing these? And we broke it out by rubric. And this is helpful for you so you know which areas to focus on with your candidates. So for cycle one, a lot of submissions, 2,272, but by rubric, so rubric one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you can see, again, we're reiterating that cycle one, rubric five and six, 
a um, lot of condition codes with those. So if you can help your candidates in those areas. And for cycle two, again, uh, rubric three, four, five, and nine. So we want to um, really emphasize have the rubrics with the candidates when, before they submit to make sure that they're meeting all of the requirements. And then the next slide. Our top five condition codes that we use for cycle one and two, and you will see a recurring pattern. Students not visible, students not visible, students not visible, students not visible, candidate is not visible, candidate is not visible. So it's really, really important that you are conveying to the candidates that the, they need to meet the requirements of seeing the students. All right, next slide. And I can um, take this one, Liz, if you like. Yeah, thanks. Right. So um, there are two places where you can find complete lists of all the condition codes. One is on the Cal TPA website. We have the, the link listed there on the slide. It's on the assessment policies webpage. Uh, there is a complete list of um, submission requirements and then the subsequent list of condition codes a candidate can receive for not meeting those submission requirements. That is a public facing page. Candidates have access to this as well as uh, uh, programs and faculty. The other place where condition code information is available is within the results analyzer tool in Ed Reports. So uh, those program coordinators and score report contacts that have uh, accounts on the Pearson Ed Reports platform. Um, when you go in to access candidate score data, specifically the condition code report, uh, there is also a list or a key or a cheat whatever you wanna call it in that location as well. So you don't have to go hunting for the condition codes. They're readily listed right there within the report itself. And we'll pass it back. I think we're going to Q&A next. Or no, we're going to reports, Amy. Thanks, Lori. So, um... We do want to remind all of you as program coordinators, this is either a job that you are taking on or you have designated a data analyst who's working with you. Um, but we do need you to be looking at your results analyzer program and examining uh, your program effectiveness and ca candidate competence. So a lot of the questions that are kind of coming into the chat that we will try to get back to um, are talking about, you know, well, what's the difference between what's happening with multiple subject and single subject candidates and things like that. The first step you should be taking is looking at your own data at, and asking those questions to see if you're seeing patterns in your program. And then of course, we're looking statewide and looking for patterns as well. Um, but hopefully all of you are aware that Results Analyzer is a tool that we've provided for you to take a look at your data month by month, scoring window by scoring window, and then year by year. And we do provide the state averages. Uh, programs are encouraged to review the following reports. So um, for each score reporting period, uh, which is basically uh, coming along every month of the year, we hope that you are really getting into your data and looking at who uh, has registered, who you, are you expecting to submit, uh, and then also looking at the condition codes to see which condition codes are the most uh, prevalent in your program. We would hope you're doing that every month and then addressing uh, and right um, helping uh, candidates not make those condition code um, missteps. The other thing quarterly, we really um, need you to be looking at your rubric summary data. We don't know that you're gonna see much change from month to month, but at least every three or four months, you should be looking at your rubric level data, which is again, a report that you can pull from the data that you receive. And then also looking at your pass rate analysis 
and then how many candidates are actually needing to retake, who's not passing on their first attempts, and then digging in and looking at, is this all about one rubric in our program? Is this something we need to be thinking about shoring up in our program? Is this something um, that we can just quickly correct because it's a misunderstanding? Whatever it is, we really do hope you're using the data that you're getting on a monthly basis um, to guide you. So next slide, please. Uh, by the way, if you're not up on how to use Results Analyzer or um, Ed Reports, we do technical assistance around helping support you learning to learn how to use it. Uh, we've offered it multiple times over the years, and we're happy to offer it again going forward. If you would like support uh, with Results Analyzer, just put a note to us in the chat, and we will um, either offer a webinar or, or, or reach out and work with you independently so that you can um, have access to your data and know how to manipulate it. So we will pause. Uh, James, are there a couple questions that we should handle right now? I do want to note that we have about half an hour left with you today, and we want um, to share some more information with you. So we just uh, can't take all questions today. But of course, we are available every single week in office hours on Thursday mornings at 10. And you can always shoot us a direct email. Uh, so yes, James, uh, let's. Sure, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> A couple of questions have come in from a, uh, some individuals asking about the condition, the condition code numbers compared to fall of 2019. So Tina, do you want to talk about that condition codes from uh, the, sure. the fall of 2019 sure. versus this? Do you have, yeah. Yeah, um, prior to COVID, um, condition codes were hovering just on average, just shy of 5%. So moving to an online environment and the challenges around recording and uh, having cameras on, uh, permissions, all of those nuances has resulted in an increase of condition codes in year three, partially year two as well, when we hit um, the spring of 2020 on. Maybe one more question, James, is there another one? Sure, uh, another one uh, was with regard to um, the uh, model examples of online learning, if there's going to be any that are, will be posted. A full submission posted? Is that the question? Uh, I believe uh, looking at uh, a on you know a model in an online setting, uh, you know, with videos and that type of thing, uh, you know, mid range, similar to what has already yes. been posted, but yes. in an online setting. Yes. Yeah, so we are working on that. I'm not sure when we can promise to have it up, but we are uh, looking to have that up. In the meantime, you have the photographs in this um, power presentation that we just shared with you. And there is guidance on the website around online settings. So hopefully that is helpful. Um, it takes us quite a number of months to get through all of our ADA compliance regulations and things like that to be able to post submissions. But we are looking uh, to post some as we move through the spring. And just as a reminder, Amy, I think it might be good to uh, have everyone remember that uh, now with uh, in order for us to be within ADA guidelines, it does take more time than we used to take because we have to make sure that submissions are available uh, and do meet ADA requirements. Yes. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. We have some more observations. I wanna make sure we have time to share with you about what we're seeing in the submissions. So um, we're gonna move ahead here into guidance, material guidance, and we'll go to the next slide. And I think, Laurie, I'm turning it back to you. Okay, hey, assessment material updates is a subject or a topic that we touched on at our fall coordinator meeting. Um, but I think there um, is enough questions about this that we wanted to talk about it again. Um, we've released the year three assessment materials back in July of 2020. Um, once materials are released, um, very rarely do we uh, uh, release a new uh, uh, volume of a, an assessment guide in the middle of a year for obvious reasons. Um, version control um, becomes more difficult uh, once you've, uh, with so many programs and so many candidates. So uh, the way that we handle 
revisions during the year is through a um, document that we call the assessment material update. And um, it, many of you program coordinators may recall the last uh, assessment material update we published was back in mid-December and an email communication did go out right before the holidays. So I don't, I don't fault you if you don't remember that. Um, but uh, it referred to a document that is available to faculty in the, um, on the faculty resource webpage in the assessment materials zip file that is downloadable, password protected. And I'm gonna go show that in just a moment um, where you can find that uh, document. And also the assessment material updates are available to candidates in through the Pearson ePortfolio system. When they register, they are posted right next to the assessment guides. So um, as they're preparing their submissions, they have direct access to both the performance assessment guides and the assessment material updates. And so James, if you wanna let me share my screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I will stop sharing and you can share your screen now. I am going to show everyone where on the website these assessment material updates are located. Are we seeing the Cal uh, TPA website? Or the uh, CTP yes. exams website? Okay. Yes. Hopefully yes. this is familiar to everybody on the on the call. I'm going to take us, uh, we, this is the home page. Um, hopefully people are familiar with navigating to the TPA website, um, TPA homepage. Just select Cal TPA. And this is the home landing page for Cal TPA. And in the right hand nav bar is the faculty policy and uh, policies and resources link. So we'll click on that. And then midway down the page is the assessment materials section. So we'll go ahead and open that up. And here are the zip files that I was talking about. There is a separate file um, for each of the different types of guides, multiple subjects, single subject, and world languages. The update document is the same for all three. And um, I'm gonna, so I'll demonstrate the multiple subject, but note that the, the information is also located uh, in the single subject and the world language zip files as well. So I have now downloaded the multiple subject zip file. I'm gonna open that up. And it opened it on my other screen, so I'm gonna drag it over. And here you can see the list of all the materials, the, the guide and all of the templates for cycle one and cycle two. And here at the bottom is the Cal TPA updates document. Can't see it. Can't see it. It didn't drag over. Correct. All right. Let me share again. Is it showing now? I think we have a, um, yes. your Zoom is only allowing me to show, um, it's not allowing me to show an entire screen, it's only allowing me to show a window. So I may not be able to show two windows at the same time. Are you seeing the uh, zip file now? No. We flashed it for a moment, but it went mm -hmm. away. Okay. Well, um, it's basically a file directory to my computer. So I'm going to go ahead and open the update file and I will share that.
All right. Hopefully you are seeing the update yes. file now. Yes. Perfect. All right. So um, I'll go through this briefly. Uh, the, the update document is broken up into sections. The first section is a current um, list of which version of each of the documents, the performance assessment, all of the templates, um, and uh, other, other documents associated, what version we're currently using. And as you can see, we are still on version three um, for most of the documents, multiple subject, single subject, and world language. The next section is a summary history of the updates that we have had. And you can see here, the last update was on December 3rd. And there's a brief summary of what the updates entailed. We also had an update on September 10th and June 30th in back in 2020. So this is an ongoing document. It continues to collect us, uh, updates throughout the year. These updates will all be gathered and applied to the assessment guides for year four. So in summer of this year, when we come out with year four materials, all of these updates will be incorporated into the guides. The next section is a detail of each of the updates. And uh, it tells you which cycle the update takes place in, which version, um, and the abbreviations here, MS for multiple subject, SS for single subject, and WL for world language. And then a detailed description of exactly what the change was. And I will let you know that the updates in December were primarily centered around step four and the self-reflection video. The change basically says that candidates can stop and start their camera if they choose to do a video recorded self-reflection. Uh, it was determined that the rule of not editing, not being continuous and not editing was it really intended for the videos that capture the, um, the instruction with the students. And we didn't necessarily need to hold candidates to that same um, criteria for their own reflection videos. It's certainly fine for them to answer uh, one of the prompts, stop the camera, collect themselves, start the camera again and answer another prompt. So definitely if you haven't um, taken a look at this update document, um, do, do go and download it and take a look. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, you can always contact uh, the CalTPA program support. Back to you, James. Okay, so our next piece, COVID-19 flexibilities and responsibilities. Yep, thank you, James. So we're gonna move along here and have a, a bit of time to talk about the flexibilities that are in place and have been in place um, for quite a number of months now, but we wanted to make sure everybody was aware of them. So please go to the next slide. So um, thinking about our candidates and thinking about all they're trying to manage, we are hoping multiple supports are in place to help guide and assist. Um, and excuse the word administrators, that should be the word teachers, to complete their preliminary programs. Um, we do need to think about the preliminary program responsibilities, what we are doing as commission staff, what the candidate themselves need to, to keep on their plate, what the employer is helping them do, hopefully, and induction programs. And information related to these flexibilities is found here at the commission's website, www.ctc.ca.gov. There's a banner when you first come into this website that takes you right in to all of the flexibilities that have been established. And I do want to let you know, we have a commission item coming up in February that will readdress COVID flexibilities again. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are a few things we do wanna to bring to your attention around the assessment guide. And 
Um, we do want to point out uh, we have been holding candidate office hours in an effort uh, uh, that lines up with our responsibilities as commission staff to help candidates, candidates that have moved out of teacher prep into induction and may not yet have um, had the opportunity to get support. So we said, well, we will try and offer support directly to candidates. And on Wednesday afternoons, we invite candidates who are on the executive order preliminary or on a PSVTW, the waiver, uh, to come and talk to us directly at the staff. And that happens on Wednesday afternoons and how to get there, the information is in the PSDE news. Uh, but when we're talking to candidates, uh, sometimes they say to us that they, they, they've never actually seen the assessment guide. Now, this is hard for us to understand. We don't know whether it's because they just haven't registered yet, but they're starting in a course to talk about it or whether uh, or what, or they just haven't looked at it. We're not sure, but do make sure that your candidates have access to the assessment guide that they should be receiving when they register and that they actually read it and perhaps you know really have an opportunity in your courses or in your support supports um, to talk about the assessment guide what it asks for and what the rubrics say uh, sometimes we're hearing that programs have rewritten the assessment guide we're not really sure um, if that is helpful or not but we do know checklists and things like that have been developed that have been helpful uh, so do be careful, though, that you are translating correctly from the assessment guide into any documents you're creating. Preliminary programs are sending candidates to induction. Uh, we've heard sometimes they never have access to the performance assessment at all in their teacher prep program, they're telling us. Uh, last year was an intense year, and if you started your program in January and COVID hit, maybe this is absolutely um, the case, you just never got into the performance assessment work because you were dealing with courses in clinical practice. We, co we totally understand, but we are hoping in teacher prep that there is at least an introduction uh, to the structure and what is performance assessment and why do we have them. Uh, program specified video platforms. We have been talking to candidates uh, who are in a program that have adopted a video platform um, and that video platform has its own bells and whistles, so to speak. Uh, we've talked to candidates who have annotated their local platform videos and are not realizing that when they come into the evaluation systems uh, system to upload their videos, they have to re-annotate. So please um, make sure candidates are clear about the expectations at the program level versus what is required um, in the performance assessment system itself. And as I said, February 11th and 12th, we do have a commission meeting coming up that will offer uh, some more supports and, and, hope, and potential flexibilities to candidates as we move forward into the spring. And in so many places in California, we still see high COVID numbers and school closures. Next slide, please. So we're gonna go ahead and move into events uh, that are upcoming that should be helpful. And we're gonna start though, but with a, uh, just a quick reminder here, um, while our work, uh, the staff who's with you today is primarily uh, in the realm of performance assessment, uh, the, the development of it, the implementation of it, the ongoing uh, operation, and then supports we're providing as we go. We know that this data, the outcomes data was originally uh, conceived of informing um, program accreditation. So if you're coming into a spring accreditation or you're facing one in the fall and all of you are somewhere in the seven year cycle, we do want you to know that data, the annual data submissions, the ADS system that's been developed is now going to start um, in the spring, including passage rates for the TPA. And in your review and common standards review submissions, um, this information should be included in your documents that you're preparing for your accreditation uh, whatever point in the cycle you are finding yourself in. Site visits, if you have a site visit coming up, they will begin using Cal TPA or TPA uh, results as part of the program sampling and asking uh, completers themselves about it. Those um, end of program surveys that can candidates complete for the commission now have questions about their TPA experiences. And then finally, uh, remember programs are required to document what is going on during COVID? What changes are you making in regard to supporting uh, those waiver candidates as they leave your program, but still have program requirements to fulfill beyond the TPA and ORECA, and also for those candidates who are leaving and going on into induction. So just a quick uh, slide on, remember 
all of this outcomes data will be rolled up into the accreditation process and that that is starting to happen. So um, be aware, uh, it's really important for you to understand the data and uh, those earlier slides on results analyzer, et cetera, is important. So those of you who put in the chat, you'd like support, that's great. We will reach out to you. Next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it back to Zoltan, who's gonna take us through our spring uh, training calendar and uh, talk a little bit about submission deadlines and ongoing supports. So Zoltan, back to you. All right, thank you for being with us. We are in the final 15 minutes here. Um, so again, here, again, you're going to, we're gonna share this uh, deck with you so you have all of these slides, um, but our spring assessor training is uh, coming up towards the middle and end of February and into March. And here are the dates for um, the, the general session, the multiple subject sessions, and the single subject sessions. I'll leave that up rather than just reading it to you. Um, James, if we can go to the next slide. Um, also, for your candidates to know and for the program as well, um, these are the upcoming submission deadlines to get your uh, results by a particular date. Um, this will be invaluable for your candidates in the coming months. Um, so again, you'll have access to this on, on the slide deck as well. Let's leave that for a moment. You can just take a quick look. And we could move on again, James. I see, I see a question about, uh, will, will you be sharing the slide deck in the chat? We're going to email it out to everybody. We want to make a couple of changes and make sure that some, uh, some of the links are uh, working on this for you. So we'll be sending this out, uh, not this afternoon, but uh, tomorrow or early next week. Um, again, uh, ongoing supports for candidates and programs. Um, the thing that strikes me every time I'm in one of these office hours um, is that is the collective knowledge around uh, this developing work. You know, th this is again, I use the, the uh, word new normal that everybody's experiencing. Um, and it's great to see um, the collaboration among candidates and among programs and sharing resources and discussing in these, uh, in these office hours. It's not just us giving information. So again, I think we are in a period of time where the more people we have bring their good minds to this work, uh, the better. So we have, again, three kinds of office hours, uh, the preparation program office hours on Thursdays at 10 a.m., the induction program office hours on Thursdays at 9 a.m., candidate office hours Wednesdays afternoons 4.15. Um, last Friday of the month, we also have the virtual think tank that we have uh, one coming up next uh, Friday, which I'll be talking about. And uh, our very own um, James Webb and Vicki Graff from Loyola are going to be presenting on an update on the education specialist Cal TPA and pilot study. And again, in these um, think tanks, there's, there's just a lot of good sharing of ideas and I really encourage you to attend if you um, at all can. And, um, oh, never mind. You're gonna get into it next. I was just gonna say the VTTs are on our playlist, but here, let me let advance and you can talk about this little ton. Okay. Again, uh, and again, looking at resources, we're really work, uh, working to document all of these meetings. We're recording, uh, uh, this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to uh, the YouTube channel as well. So make sure you're accessing those for past meetings that you're not able to attend or, or ones that are coming up in the future. Uh, we have a lot of uh, group video supports um, for the Cal TPA as well. Um, and again, I think, over time, these, we are really being diligent about adding resources to these, uh, to these sites. Uh, we know that we all need information. Um, and so uh, just keep checking back. You know, there's, it's a growing body of work there. And is this, uh, Amy, is this yours? Uh, sure. New program coordinator list. Um, I'm going to actually have Lori talk to you because she is the keeper of our program coordinator list. And we are sharing that list with you now in the hopes that you all will get in touch and, and potentially uh, have ways to support each other. But Lori, would you like to talk about this for a second? Sure. For those who um, were registered prior um, 
to or who registered officially registered for this meeting and for all official coordinators. Um, an email went out yesterday with an updated contact form for all programs participating in the Cal TPA. And we have the primary um, uh, program coordinator contact for each of the programs listed in their emails. Um, our hope is that, um, you know, as this community builds, that, that you can reach out to your uh, counterparts at other institutions and share um, feel free to, you know, ask questions, share best practices. Um, so we're making this list available. At the bottom of the list, as well as on the slide here, uh, there is a link. Um, if your program's co contact coordinator has changed, um, it, there's an online uh, form to, uh, change, to, to change your contact information. Um, and we'll go ahead and get that updated for you. So hopefully that you'll find that helpful. I know what we did receive, it did generate a number of change form requests. I saw they all hit my inbox. So <laughs> I know we have a few out there. So M Michelle Hall is just asking for clarification about the links. Lori, did you just say? What was the question? Links to update the change form. Work. Oh, the change form itself has a link down at the bottom of the form, the PDF form, um, to the contact change form. Just FYI, that link is also included on every every correspondence that comes out from from our office. Every time you get a Cal TPA program update, that link is included in the footer of the emails. So, Michelle, hopefully, uh, you asked where the form is located. Um, Hopefully Lori's answer just took care of your question. All right, we are going to uh, introduce you to uh, the evaluation. We'd like you to take a minute and fill out so we can see if we are being uh, as helpful as we can be to you. We certainly hope we're being helpful when we have these program coordinator meetings and we do want to make sure that we're asking for input on how we can do our job better in supporting you. We have moved from having one coordinator meeting a year to having four. And uh, we do record and archive these so that you can have access after you will have this complete slide deck uh, available that will be sent to you by Lori after this um, meeting closes. And so James, I'm gonna uh, turn it to you to talk about this just for a second and people can um, take two minutes now maybe and fill it out for us. And then we will go ahead and take uh, the, some more questions once we um, introduce them to the evaluation. Sure, so I have uh, placed it here. It is a bit.ly uh, and slash TPA winter. It is case sensitive. So please make sure that you enter in the letters exactly as they are written. I have, however, placed it into the chat uh, twice and uh, you should be able to click on this and then access the evaluation. Just want to let everyone know that as soon as we are finished here today, I will render the video and then upload it to the playlist. So it should be up by this evening. And uh, just be patient. Uh, YouTube now uh, is reaching a high level of capacity and renderings for videos. So it is taking a little bit longer than it used to because so many programs and businesses are using YouTube to archive their meetings. So I just wanted to let Everyone know it will be available. It will also be closed captioned as well. I, I also wanted to add um, at the end of this deck, we will be sending it out. There are about 50 additional slides that we uh, didn't want to run through uh, in this two hours with you today um, that are additional resources for you. And they're, they're uh, collected by topic. Make sure that you access uh, those as well. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of you for attending. Here are some more links and ways for you to find us. Uh, but James, um, why don't we just see if there are a couple more uh, questions that we might handle real quick here in our last five minutes together. Okay, so um, Allison has uh, an, an idea um, looking at how to uh, 
again, uh, provide support, um, perhaps a forum or a link web page for induction programs to reach out to support. Um, Allison, that's a great idea. We did do something in the fall, I believe it's around November. We did it for both uh, teacher induction programs as well as administrator induction programs. And um, we are hopefully uh, going to be able to facilitate this again in the spring. Uh, so we will be in contact with uh, induction programs and also Karen Sacramento, uh, the consultant who oversees teacher induction programs to uh, see if we can definitely put that forward again. Yeah, and James, the other thing I wanna add is that we are um, gonna be planning to do this almost identical uh, workshop for induction uh, folks. We talked to some this morning in our office hours and realized that they uh, really need a lot of support. And so we're going to um, try and double our efforts in reaching out to them. We had a great induction conference in December, many attended. We were able to talk to a lot of them. And they also have office hours. Karen Sacramento is the induction coordinator uh, for the state of California and she's been offering things as well. So if you are with us today and you're in induction or you are a preliminary program and you're in touch with induction folks, let them know that the commission is uh, looking to offer even more for them. So please stay tuned. And Allison, again, thank you so much that you are willing to help induction colleagues. Again, this is something that the commission, when it talks about providing supports, uh, the support that you can provide each other in the field is so important. And we really appreciate your willingness to offer these uh, opportunities to our induction colleagues. Because again, it's what's best for our candidates, which we know translates into what's best for our students in California. All right, so a few more questions, James. Anything else in the chat that we can address? Uh, yes, Kelly's asking a question about any updates on candidates who pass CalTPA but not CSET uh, and the eligibility for their preliminary credential. Yes, and I would say, Kelly, I need to direct you back to the commission website and to the um, flexibilities there around CBEST and CSET. And that's in the, uh, Amy, to clarify, that's in that green banner that's at the top? Correct. Of the, okay. Or reach out, if you have a particular question, reach out to us and we will uh, do what we can to get your question to the right person. Okay, so Amy, at this time, um, Oh, I did receive a question. Uh, somebody asked, uh, when will the slide deck be mail available? Do we have a ETA on that? Lori? Oh. I think Zoltan was saying early next week. Well, or okay. Possibly tomorrow, but by Monday. Yeah, so we'll get this uh, webinar sent to you directly to your email address. It will come to you from Lori Thornley. There are a few other things uh, that she has to update program coordinators about. So we will send you this PowerPoint as well as those other updates and it will come out either tomorrow. Is today Thursday? Yes, tomorrow. <laughs> Losing track of time. Tomorrow is Friday uh, or uh, at the latest by uh, Monday. Um, so please watch for that. And we hope it's a helpful PowerPoint. And Amy, at this time, uh, no questions. Uh, looks like everyone is saying their thank yous and are ready to depart. We are at three o'clock. Um, oh, somebody says, what happened to Wayne? Wayne Baser retired on July 31st of 2020. So he is enjoying the good life. Mm -hmm. We've been missing him the last six months. Uh, but yes, Wayne, Wayne Baser, uh, amazing educator. Uh, decided it was time to retire and he has retired from the commission's work. Uh, the other thing I wanted to remind all of you is that we will meet with you again in April. So watch for the date. We haven't identified a date yet, but our next meeting with you will uh, be held in April of 2021. And Amy, uh, we're getting some questions with regard to results analyzer. Lori, would it be best uh, if some people have forgotten some information that they emailed the ES Cal TPA at Pearson for help with results analyzer? 
Yes, I was typing that in the chat. Oh, okay. Speaking. Thank All you. Right, we'll so see. Okay. Christina, there you go. If you just email that es-caltpa at pearson.com, you will get your support to remember your email.